cabinet members and a Labor team that will um, restore us to the best country in the world. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I now call SNP spokesperson Owen Thompson. Thank you, Mr Mandel, and it's a pleasure to serve with you in the chair. Um, it's a bit of a challenge to prepare for a debate like this today because we're living through the most unprecedented series of political earthquakes with the ground constantly shifting beneath our feet. It, it's almost like we're living in a time when the longevity of a prime minister or a chancellor is measured in hours rather than months and years. So do please forgive me if I keep an eye on my phone to make sure that <laughs> ministers and policies remain the same as when I rose. But it is good to see that the minister in his place and that he's certainly not hiding under any desks uh, as, as others may have been <laughs> suggested that they were. But the short-lived government has pivoted so many times already there's been so many U-turns that there's absolutely no idea what direction that we're travelling in. We're lurching speedily towards a cliff edge. Effectively, all of the promises and pledges so firmly given by the Prime Minister during the long and tedious leadership campaign and reinforced several times over the last couple of weeks have been abandoned. We we'll have to be left wondering if the notorious mini-budget was a mere mirage to our collective consciences, a tax cut to the wealthiest, the basic rate cut, the dividend tax cut, the corporation tax cut, all gone, along with the former Chancellor himself. The only positive bit, I guess, the, the two-year energy cap that provided so much needed certainty to struggling households, it's gone. It's not even there now. So what next? Who knows? The Prime Minister might even have gone by the time I sit down. Although, who would take over the poison chalice is another matter. Even as an opposition member, I have to say, it's almost too painful to watch at times the embarrassing farce of a government limping on. It feels, particularly shambolic, it feels like a particularly shambolic episode of The Apprentice. And I, at this stage, I don't think I'd be surprised if Lord Sugar suddenly appeared to fire the lot of them. It's certainly beyond any parody that could be imagined in the thick of it. And I'm sure a few of us could imagine or only begin to imagine what might be coming out of the mouth of Malcolm Tucker if he were having to deal with such a situation. You have to know it's gone too far, though, when you can no longer tell the satire from the ridiculous reality. But the gross economic consequences of the incompetence of all of it has deadly serious consequences for millions of people uh, across the UK. These are people working 40 hours or more a week and are still unable to make ends meet. Established businesses at risk of going under because they can't afford to pay soaring energy bills. Families going hungry or afraid of losing their homes. I held a cost of living event in Gorebridge in my constituency just on Friday past where I had invited the Prime Minister to attend so that she might be able to answer directly uh, constituents' concerns. However, despite watching out for her, I, I regret to inform the, the House that she, she didn't attend. A bit like the, earlier today. I was hearing harrowing stories there, though, from many people struggling simply to make ends meet, and they didn't know where to turn. Now, we've got a fantastic sense of community in Midlothian, and we had a great range of partners in attendance, so we were able to point people to some of the right places. But what can people do when the government fails so spectacularly and the people it's meant to serve? So I completely understand where the petition has come from and why it's gathered such high numbers, now 633,000, uh, and continually to rise. It's, uh, I'm watching it clock up as a, a stand, uh, including over 1,000 people in my own constituency of Midlothian. People are absolutely scunnered by what they've witnessed. And at a time of crisis, when they want competent government of their own choosing, not a prime minister chosen by a few, and in response to the petition, the government argued that the UK is not a presidential system. I'm glad they finally acknowledged that because the Prime Minister and our predecessor, whose paw prints are all over the mess that we're in, don't seem to hold much truck in collective decision making. They blatantly disregarded evidence. It seemed reluctant to inform cabinet colleagues of their latest bag of the fag packet policy. And for some time, there's been an unhealthy trend in the UK towards more personality-based politics, something that perhaps needs to be reflected on in calmer times. Of course, having a government that we didn't vote for isn't something new for those of us in Scotland. 
It's a normal state over the last number of years. And I'm very grateful, at least, that we have a clear exit route in front of us to escape from this Buerich with a modern, proportionate parliamentary system working well in Holyrood already and a Scottish Government ready with an alternative plan for our future, should the people choose it. Independence for Scotland is not a threat to the rest of the UK or the social bonds we cherish. It's an opportunity for a more equal partnership where Scotland could demonstrate to the rest of these isles the genuine alternative to the status quo. We could protect the fabric of our communities, look after vulnerable citizens and protect our landscapes and nature. We could build a new greener industrial base, becoming the renewable powerhouse of Europe and rejoining our European partners in free trade and travel across the continent. We could value everyone, no matter where they come from, and create a fairer, wealthier and more equal society. This will create sustainable, shared prosperity far better than any trickle-down economics ever could, relying on scraps from a rich man's table. In Scotland, we have a cast-iron mandate for a referendum on our future. Yet still, this discredited government, and disappointingly, I have to say, the official opposition, still seem to block all democratic paths to achieve it. Choice is the key issue here, something that seems to have been forgotten in the corridors of power in this place, the right to self-determination is a fundamental and inalienable right of all people. It's enshrined in international law, in the UN Charter, and the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. The UK government supports the principle for other countries, but not, it seems, for Scotland. For this chaotic and unpopular government to continue to say no to a referendum is more like the actions of a dictatorship than a democracy. And I hope whoever the next Prime Minister is, whenever they come along, will reconsider this position. While I agree with the growing call for a general election, it's not a long-term solution for our broken system. I would urge all Democrats, whether supporting independence or not, to get behind Scotland's right to choose. Democracy is not a one-time event. We've seen a Prime Minister who's been able to change her mind within the space of a matter of days and the policies that she's got. So why shouldn't the people of Scotland be able to change their mind after eight years of broken promises? The ground's shifted many times. All the big claims from Better Together have been so spectacularly wrong. Staying in the UK didn't keep us in the European Union. It did not protect energy prices, and it most certainly didn't keep the economy on a steady course. The future of Scots mortgages and pensions has never been more uncertain than it is today. And when circumstances change, the people have a right to change their minds, as we see demonstrated again and again by the U-turn after U-turn from the current Prime Minister. Whatever the party of government choose to do next, we have to remember that the crisis we face didn't begin with the current Prime Minister, at least the one who was the Prime Minister at the time of writing. And it won't end when she goes, if indeed she is still in post. We've had 12 years of conservative mismanagement, We've energy policies unfit for purpose and austerity policies bringing public services to their knees. We've no solution to the continued chaos from Brexit, a disaster for our businesses, public sector, for education and research, for holidaymakers, travel and cultural life. And sadly, Labour have no answer to that point. Another general election might put a plaster on some of these wounds, but it won't heal the UK's chronic problems. Independence for Scotland is an idea whose time has come and it can't come soon enough.